Hello everyone, uh, welcome to uh, something a bit different for this channel, a video, a review at that, of a movie that is less edited and much less scripted. And I want to do this to sort of increase my validity as a critic uh, for you, the audience, the viewer, uh, sort of to appear smarter than I am. <laughs> And to just sort of, you know, talk about movies that I sort of enjoy and I have something to say about, even if it's not the most entertaining, uh, red letter media, original, funny way. I should also point out that I have an outline right here on the laptop. And so if I'm looking down a bunch, <laughs> that is what I'm doing. It's just sort of uh, outlines just to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, I usually heavily script my videos if it's not obvious, so this is going to be a bit more, bit of a, uh, bit of a departure from the comfort zone of Sir Chancelot channel. So all of that out of the way, today we're going to be talking about a film that I watched virtually at New York Film Festival this year. Uh, they opened up a virtual cinema, and I was able to watch, uh, five titles, five great titles I very much, uh, enjoyed the opportunity to watch these. I've That's the first time I've ever been able to attend or I guess participate in a film festival. So I was very uh, fortunate and happy that they opened that up to anywhere in the country to participate in. And one of the titles that I saw at the film festival was Simone Barbet or Virtue. Now, obviously, this is not the real DVD. If I if I tricked anybody, uh, I don't have the real DVD. In fact, I don't even know if a DVD version exists. I know there's a VHS, uh, but this is a very, very small film that I am assuming that practically none of you are going to have heard of. Uh, I think this is going to be one of very few videos in English uh, on the internet about this film. It is a French film released in 1980 and was directed by Marie-Claude Trelu. I'm probably butchering the name, but something, <laughs> something like that. And it was actually her debut feature, which is incredibly impressive because I love this film a lot. I thought it's really great. And I think that it should be mentioned, I sort of talked about how small this film was, uh, just for some scale. Uh, only 400 accounts, a little more than 400 accounts, have marked this as watched on Letterboxd. Well, all of that being said, I think this definitely deserves, if any title does, uh, to be called an underrated or hidden gem. Although those phrases have been applied to so many things at this point, I doubt it can really be applied with much validity, but um, I think New York Film Festival actually described it as uh, criminally underrated in their description, so don't just take it from me. Uh, the film is a triptych, which is a big boy word used by the film festival website again. Just a piece of art that is split into three distinct parts. I didn't know what the word meant, I had to look it up, I'm just you know, <laughs> um, but, and it just follows the titular Simone Barbet and her night, or I guess evening through morning, uh, in Paris, specifically a region in Paris, again, not that I'm very familiar with, uh, that area, but, um, specifically in a region called Montparnasse. Again, pronunciation is out the window, but it's, it's something like that. And this location plays a heavy role in the film, specifically that region. Uh, the location, that specific location is brought up many times, almost in every single part. And it plays a great deal, or a large role in the thematic and overall overarching uh, messages of the film, specifically of urban loneliness and class disparity. And not that I am, like I mentioned, at all very familiar with that area, but from what I gathered from the film, from uh, a clip from the director, and from various reviews, uh, 
it is a very, very much uh, related to the messages of the film. I think that's something, even if you are not acquainted with this area in the 80s in France, uh, it's something that, uh, at least I know in America, that is still very much a prevalent issue today. So these three parts are, the first one is Simone and her co-worker, whose name I cannot remember. It, it, it's been about a month since I watched this. Uh, I sort of had to refresh my memory on a lot of stuff, so if I get a couple of details wrong, keep that in mind as well. But um, Simone and her co-worker uh, work as usherettes in a pornography theater, and it sort of follows their shift, or her, specifically Simone's shift there. And then the second part, which in my opinion is the most memorable and probably my favorite, but I'll get into why later, but um, Simone leaves, I think it is about uh, midnight, I'm pretty sure. Again, details are a bit fuzzy. But uh, she leaves and sort of goes out onto the street with all of these vibrant, uh, specifically like red and greenish lights. And she ends up at a lesbian nightclub. And then she sort of spends her time there. And I'll, I'm going to talk about this segment in a bit more detail later. So just uh, bear with me for that. And then the third and final part, uh, which is probably the most... Uh, I guess the strangest of the parts, because it's mainly just dialogue between two characters. It's very, uh, it's the most direct part as well in terms of the deliverance of the commentary and uh, uh, th thematic uh, elements. And it is Simone sort of driving around with a stranger, a sort of older gentleman type guy. And that is, and then... And then they sort of just drive around uh, until the sunrise, and it ends with a fairly memorable shot of the sunrise, like a bluish sky. And each part is uh, incredibly distinct, both uh, visually and tonally, but there is a sort of unified theme of comedy turning sour. And while that is sort of the most unifying uh or directly unifying uh, commonality between all three parts, I think there is definitely a lot of commentary or deeper thematic messages, such as uh, disparity in class, I think definitely shows up in all three segments. Uh, I think one of the bigger ones would be performances and sort of how we act differently around different people. Simone acts like a completely different person in the pornography theater as she does at the nightclub. And this extends beyond just how characters act at certain places. It also is about how we perform in terms of gender roles. There's a lot of uh, commentary on sort of forced masculinity. And I think, again, there is very much so a lot about sort of this urban isolation or loneliness where uh, she's surrounded by people and even people that she likes to an extent but there's just something missing there's something not quite right and I'll talk a bit about that uh, in more detail later on so I realize uh, like this video uh, this film kind of sounds a bit sporadic and rushed considering I should have mentioned this earlier it's only 77 minutes in its runtime and while, in a way, it is sort of a mess, if you will, but it's so tightly constructed and uh, elegant in its presentation that it creates an atmosphere that is very unique and ties everything together. And I want to talk more about the atmosphere because that is one of the sort of stronger elements of this film. Uh, the atmosphere varies very distinctly from section to section, but is, has a very strong presence in each. Uh, each section is so visually and stylistically different, and yet there is some form of distinct atmosphere throughout the entire film. And again, all of this is sort of tied together by this repetition or sort of just hammering home all of these central ideas and themes. I think one of the most uh, clear examples of this would be in the nightclub section, which is the second part. Um, I mentioned that this probably was one of my favorite parts, and I think it is because of the vibrant colors and the sort of extremely... Uh, 
tangible energy or environment that the film presents this area as. And I think, I mean, you can see throughout the entire thing, there's dancing, there's singing, there's all this music, there's all this witty dialogue. And it keeps this energy going, but then slowly over time, there's some dialogue between characters. I don't want to get into too much detail, obviously, because I want you to go and watch the film. But uh, over time, this energy sort of dies down and eventually sort of devolves from this atmosphere of sort of fun event down into something a lot sadder and, in this specific part, even something a bit violent. Really, it's a character study that is, in a lot of ways, messy, yes, but it is so well constructed, it's very intricate and thought out, and it's very uh, elegant and sort of pristine in its presentation that it creates something I think is quite unique in terms of this sort of formulaic film. And not and when I say unique, it's not unique in the way that its sort of messages are in any way something that hasn't been said a million times before, because it has, but I think that the way that it goes about telling its commentary and sort of revealing the, the story over time is something, is quite something to behold, uh, in a way. And I think that, you know, if you really strip back all of this commentary, at its core it's a film about, uh, I guess it would be just love. And the director spoke on this a bit in her introduction to the film at the film festival. And it's sort of a film about the struggle and sort of balance between romance and sex and how it relates to this sort of overall, uh, well, how it extends into this larger picture of the city. And like I said earlier, this region, <laughs> which the name is escaping my mind now, and I didn't want to look back at the paper and seem unprofessional. <laughs> And in that way, I think it is sort of a microcosm of sorts, acting as just this one uh, person uh, in her evening split into three parts, sort of uh, acting as, in a way, a metaphor for life in that entire region. But again, that's just uh, sort of my own interpretation. Uh, I don't think this is exactly a film made for me, but uh, I did enjoy it quite a lot. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention before we sort of wrap this up a bit is the soundtrack. I The soundtrack is phenomenal, to say the least, uh, and it definitely does add a lot to this uh, atmosphere, which I talked about earlier. And it sort of is a very... it, it varies very much so. Varies very much so uh, from section to section as the opening and closing credits... not credits, but just the opening and closing has sort of this synthy sort of downbeat, uh, sound, soundtrack and, which I can't find anywhere on YouTube, even though it credits all of the music in the ending credits, I couldn't find any of the open, any of the synth soundtrack anyway. And it goes all the way from synth to this sort of uh, I guess you would say punk punk rock uh, from the 80s, obviously. Uh, especially in... There's a musical sequence in the nightclub from the band. Uh, t uh, I'm just going to put the text on the screen. I don't know how you would go about saying that properly. And there's a song. It's one of my favorite parts of the film. And uh, it's a real rock group. And it's a song I have since researched and discovered from their LP... Uh, J on V, and it's uh, quite a memorable and entertaining moment, and I really, I, I, I just really, <laughs> I just like that part. <laughs> uh, I think overall, I just sort of wanted to talk about this film. Uh, it's a very complex, uh, intricate film, as I mentioned, and it is definitely, I mean, jokes aside, it is a very underrated film. A hidden gem, I think, does describe this one very much. And uh, I just sort of wanted to make a video about it, because, as I mentioned, there are very few of them. Hopefully, after it got uh, its sort of, what did they call it, uh, revival, 
uh, at the film festival. Hopefully it gets a sort of widespread release, maybe Blu-ray or at least um, more widely available on digital. Um, and so if you can find a way to watch it, definitely watch it, I would say. Um, if not for the soundtrack alone, but seriously, uh, I do recommend it. Um, I will be linking in the description several reviews which I have found in preparing for this video and in sort of what my just initial watching of the film, and they are much better worded than this review will be, so I will be linking some of those in the description if you want to take a look at those. And I think that's going to be about it. Uh, this video is incredibly long right now. I am looking, I've been recording for 34 minutes. I hope that I will be able to edit this quickly and that it won't actually be 30 minutes of me rambling on and on. But anyway, that's, neither, that's no concern of yours, I guess. So uh, that's about it. I just wanted to sort of uh, shout this film out, if you will. And I kind of want to do this sort of format uh, a bit more. Obviously, I would like to eventually put a <laughs> real DVD here for a different film. But for now, we're just, we're leaving it up to state-of-the-art special effects to sort of, we're, we're just going to save it in post. Anyway, yeah, uh, that's about it. Uh, oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to mention is that you all have actually been duped. This film, I've actually been talking about Alien Apocalypse the entire time. Uh, that was what I was talking about when I said underrated Jim. You all have been fooled. Thank you and goodbye.